Hello, hello, and welcome to a wrap up. Just to speed straight into it, uh, the month of July is over. This is the first month in which I have been in Canada. Sorry to harp on about all the time, but I have had a lot of chance to read because I'm currently looking for a job, and as a result, time is there. So, what we're looking at is nine books. Uh, I have read nine books in the month of July, which is a very tasty number, uh, and you'll see that. It's three of them I finished very early into the month because um, I started them in June. So, like, until over the middle of the month, I'm at like four books and three of them were at the start because I was having a little bit of a slow middle of the month and I was reading a very large book and then suddenly I just fell straight into everything. I'm not going to go through stats this month. All I know is, is that I averaged a 3.94 stars on Storygraph, where I am a lot more accurate in terms of my ratings, you know, it's not like, God bless quarter stars, and just half stars. Goodreads is such a pile of dog shit, it's actually crazy. We have a lot of series continuations, we have a very big new favourite uh, recorded a review kind of thing. So. A lot to look forward to. I'm just going to kick straight into it by saying that I read the book that broke the world. I would say the book that wouldn't burn. But the book that broke the world by Mark Lawrence, second book in the library trilogy. I read the book that wouldn't burn earlier this year, I think. Ready for this one to come out. Grace picked it up very caringly for me, so I uh, because we I, I got it in Canada, so I wanted the same edition, like the same publisher. And... Yeah, so she picked that up, ready for when I arrived. Moment I arrived, I picked it up, and I gave it a 3.5. I gave the first one four stars. Now, while I think they're comparable writing levels, and if anything, there's stuff that I enjoyed in this book more than the first one, this is something that I'll share with a different series as well. I think they're comparable series, personally. Um, not this month, but I'm currently reading the second book in that trilogy. And essentially, I think that there's a, 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 a limit to the nuance involved in the story and the book that wouldn't burn got away with that because I was hope it's the first book in a series you know you lay down the, the, the foundations to build on that and then have those those nuanced conversations and I don't think that this book had the nuanced conversations I think it continued at the same level the characters still very enjoyable i was still invested i will say that there was a particular viewpoint that i did not care about and it's funny that it kind of switches i was interested in one part of the story and not interested in the other and then they completely flipped where i was suddenly not invested in one and invested in the one that i hadn't been previously and so it did it never felt like it was it never got onto a track where it was continuous it was always stopping and starting with what i was invested by it's a lot shorter than the first book um quite a bit shorter and i think it suffered from that i think the first book already was enjoyable but needed that next level to go into a four and a half five star and this unfortunately didn't have it and as a result because of failed potential or like missed potential in my opinion it couldn't get back up to that four star so three and a half still enjoyed the reading experience still going to finish the trilogy still a good book but not anywhere near a favorite or anything just it's one of those series that will be that i've read the series is kind of how i'm feeling um, depending on that final entry, of course. Then, uh, we have something that is, uh, without a doubt, a five-star read while being a very difficult reading experience. And, like, if you're judging a book purely off the reading experience and, like, enjoyment, this is, like, a fucking two-star. It was horrific to read. Um, and that is Know My Name by Chanel Miller. But... It is a five-star book. It is one of the most harrowing reading experiences I've ever had. It's one of um, the most visceral and incisive, uh, yeah, one of the most visceral reading experiences I've had. Chanel Miller is the woman who was um, the victim of 
uh, sexual assault by a, a, a college student who was like a, a big athlete at the time um, and became part of a big media campaign um, around her court case uh, in terms of um, his his legal proceedings and essentially this this documents is a memoir of her experience from um before then the event and after all of that naturally um and i have struggled in terms of how to talk about it there's naturally a, a trigger that it, it doesn't need saying that there's a trigger warning around it this is an extremely triggering book to read for anyone who's experienced any kind of sexual abuse. Um, it's an incredibly hard book, I imagine, for someone to read who hasn't experienced it. It's just an incredibly difficult book to read. But for someone who has experienced it, it was triggering. There's no other way to describe it. Several scenes in this book brought images to mind of personal experiences and that's an extremely hard thing to tackle an extremely difficult thing to face i will say that the the thing that i think this book does very well is that it takes because you're following her journey if you're someone who has gone through not the same experience but a comparable experience something in the same vein then you go through the journey with her and as a result you get lost in the darkness with her like that is inevitable and there are there, there is a sense of really raising up at the end but not too much it's a fucking hard read i will stress it's an incredibly incredibly important read because of course it's it's addressing the uh erasure of sexual assault it's it, it highlights the utter contempt that we all must feel towards the jury, uh, the, the justice system surrounding sexual assault um, and rape, because it's a criminally, ironically, criminally under-sentenced crime. It is something that categorically changes someone for the rest of their life, and to have someone be, do, do that to you and it be something that features not even like it, 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 it you face a sentence of not even like a 40th of your life something like that like you're doing two years maybe and you're gonna live till like over 80 like it's crazy and it also highlights the 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 violence done to women it highlights the um the way that we ignore female violence, the, the way that we hush it under the rug because there are successful boys out there. There are successful boys out there who are going to be ruined by these motherfuckers. And I am just going to use this as a point to say an argument that I despise thoroughly, consistently, forever and always. It's a stupid argument. Chanel Miller may be one of the only women or just people who have been the victim of sexual assault or rape that by a, a, a high profile figure or something like that someone with a, 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 an audience that will have a reaction in terms of this person was a, a, like meant to be the next big athlete she may be the only one that i can think of a name off the top of my head and this whole argument around the idea of like do you know when it like accusations come out and the immediate reaction is like, well, they're just doing it for attention. You cannot physically name any of them. It's just an argument that it pisses me off no end. It's just a stupid straw man argument. It's just thrown out willy-nilly with absolutely no thought at all. This idea of fucking, they're doing it for attention. Then name them. Name any of them. Name any of them that have made a career out of it. Or done anything because I can't all they've done is rack up fucking legal fees out their asshole and then they have people on the internet telling them they're doing it for attention they're doing it for clout they're doing it for career they're doing it for money what where who studies people are they in the room with us because I've never fucking seen any of them and it 
it dumbfounds me. I'm sure that it exists a very limited amount, a very rare instance. But the idea that it's an automatic reaction, an automatic statement, just grinds my fucking asshole. So, important read. I think everyone should read it. I think it should be something that's studied, something that is uh, commonplace. I think it is an exceptionally powerful, not only for the story, I think that Chanel Miller is also a fantastic writer. Um, and she guides you through that journey, through all the emotions. You collapse with her. I cried so many times throughout this book because it is just emotionally destructive, which is exactly what it was for her. And as a result, she is doing her job masterfully because she is conveying the emotions and the power of that situation. And yeah, incredible. Five star, and I will never touch the book again, honestly. Um, in a complete tonal shift, I read Chekhov. I don't even know how to transition into that. I read Chekhov, I read some of his short stories uh, because I wanted to, who would thank it? And overall, I gave it 3.25 because there was some fantastic stories in this, some, some five stars. It started so strong. At the Barbers was fantastic. Fat and Finn was fantastic. And my favorite, without a doubt, was Oh the Public which was uh, essentially about um, a guy who works on the train being, he's at the bar drinking and he's told, you need to go do your job, you need to go get check, like, check tickets. And he works on a night train. So he goes around and he wakes this man up to ask for his ticket. And the guy's like, why? Why would you do that? I'm, I've just given myself morphine because I am horrendously sick. I'm dying. I'm on this train to go like, die essentially I'm, I'm reaching the end and i'm trying to coalesce I, I i can't sleep i've i've done all this and and the main character's like i don't know what to tell you like i've been told to do this this isn't me i don't want to be doing this to you i feel bad for you but this is my job i've been asked to do it so i have to do it and they're, they're having this like go at each other and then the guy's like just leave me alone i'm, I'm, I'm just leave me alone and the guy walks away and he's he's walking down the rest of the, the carriage he's like well, maybe, maybe I should go get the train manager to go talk to this guy because I can explain. Like he can explain the fact that I didn't want to do it. It was the train manager asked me to do it, so I'm just doing my job. So he goes, gets the train manager, brings him over, and wakes the guy up. And the guy's like, "Why would you do this to me? I've just taken more morphine to be able to go back to sleep." And it's just that it's a farcical story of this this train this this guy who works on a train waking this guy up and i thought it was brilliant i thought it was the perfect short story and uh, that was the high point some of the others majority of the others honestly were just i read them they didn't evoke anything in me really um but some of them were fantastic i would still recommend just read oh the public it's like four pages long I thought Oh the Public was great. I thought Fat and Thin was a very good piece of social commentary. Um, yeah, I thought there was some real good stuff in it, but overall was just kind of enjoyable. Then we come to the behemoth of the month. The reason that between the 5th of July and the 19th of July, I didn't finish a book was because this 1,200 page behemoth was on my plate and it was so good. Reap, Reaper's Gale. Book seven of Malazan, Book of the Fallen. Malazan is just a special, special series. It is, I've said it enough. I, I, I don't, I don't think I need to repeat it. I wish there are, there are certain series that I wish I did book, like individual book reviews. And I had the time at the time when I was first, first started reading them or had the idea. But I think at the time I was so worried because book reviews don't do well that I was like, oh, but now I wouldn't, I don't give a shit. I, I'm going to start doing those for when I start new series, I think, because I, I just think it's enjoyable and I want to have longer discussion around those books. So Malazan is one that I deeply regret not having the chance to do that. But when I eventually reread it, 
same as Around the Outlings, same as um, The Wheel of Time, I wish I'd done it, I'm going to do in-depth individual reviews. Book seven. I mean, I'm at book seven. I'm clearly loving it. I have not rated a book under four stars in this series, and that was the first one. Otherwise, they have all been 4.5 or five stars. The, the series is incredible. Erickson's writing is incredible. This one may have been the only one that felt its length in the middle, because the chapters were incredibly long. Like, for Malazan long. And... I felt it a little, but that was all in service to the ending of this book, which was explosively crazy. The culmination of things that I have been waiting for, for books, literal books. And as a result, anyone who has read Reaper's Gale will know that the ending of this book is just sublime, utterly sublime. And... Yeah, like, I, you can't, I can't complain. I can't sit there and be like, the middle felt a little bit long compared to the others. When the ending, it's like, it doesn't even matter. I could have read 3,000 pages of shopping lists. And if I'd have had the last 300, 200 pages of this book, I'd have been like, those 3,000 pages were so necessary, even though they had nothing to do with it. I'd be like, that was completely in service of that ending because it's so good. Um, looking forward to Toll the Hounds, which I think my plan is because I'm doing the Stormlight reread and everything, ready for the last book. And I know people say that you should read book nine and ten of Malazan semi very close to each other. Um, I'm going to try to fit Toll the Hounds in before the end of the year. That's going to be the last one. And then next year, I'll read Dust of Dreams and Cripple God at the same time. And by that, I mean one after the other. I don't mean both at the same time, naturally, before someone clickety clacks that in the comments but that's the plan i'm looking forward to it um then i don't have this physically with me and i am putting up a review that will be up this evening that i'm recording this uh, the mercy of gods by james s a Corey. if you want full in-depth thoughts then go over there because i i kind of go into a bit more of why i liked the book but i gave it 4.5 stars it's up there with one of my favourite releases of 2024 so far, along with like Private Rights and Ghost Mountain. Um, it's a sci-fi first contact story in very accessible prose. Page Turner, uh, very interesting ideas, but just delivered in such a straightforward, understandable way that I think will be a hit. Let's put it that way. I think people are going to really love it. I have started a journey through time and space. Uh, something I've wanted to do and haven't had a chance to when I was at uni and everything is that I want to read full bibliographies of someone in chronological order from start of their career to the end and just fully immerse myself in someone's writing. And so I wrote down a list of authors that I'd be interested in doing that with, randomised it and out came Virginia Woolf. Um, I had already read A Room of One's Own, Mrs. Dalloway, and Orlando, A Biography. They're the three I'd already read, um, but Virginia Woolf has a bunch more. So I've worked it out that there's 12 texts. It includes her nonfiction and A Room of One's Own. I think that's it in terms of what I've done. But it works out with 12 books, so I'm going to do a full year, month by month, reading one of Virginia Woolf's work, just to completely say that I have read Virginia Woolf. Voyage Out, first novel, gave it three stars. Um, mainly that comes down to the fact that I have already read Virginia Woolf. I know how good she gets. I think this is a good book. Like, see, this is where we have to disagree as human beings, because I think a three star is a good book that is above average. 2.5 is average. Three is good. Whenever I do something, three is good. I understand that people are like, well, four is the beginning of good. That's not how, that's not how it works. You're limiting yourself. Like, people are like, oh, four, it starts at four, but then they're like, oh, I wish Goodreads had half ratings or like quarter ratings. You could have 
just a little bit more nuance in terms of your ratings, you're limiting yourself already by saying, oh, good starts at four. That gives you two stars of good, of good or great, good or perfect. Go down to three, treat yourself. Have a three star and go, that was good, but I have problems with it. That's my spiel over. Nevertheless, The Voyage Out was good. Essentially, this book is uh, following, um, I always forget character's name, Rachel Vinrace, who is travelling from England to South America. Um, she's going with her aunt and uncle, and essentially it is taking the trappings, the trimmings of everything, of um, a Victorian travelogue, uh, a Victorian story. Even before that, it's essentially taking the English novel, the English travel story, and subverts it in a way where we are following uh, what is essentially a tabula rasa. We're following someone who is a, a literary, in other books would be a literary stand-in to have the uh, thoughts and opinions of those around them impressed on them um, to create a character by the end. Like in a lot, a lot of literature, women are tabula rasas for uh, men to instill their thoughts and opinions on. And so this takes the concept of that both of these things, and for the first 200 pages, leans into it, sets that up as an expectation to then subvert it, where rather than the tabla rasa idea of, like, what has she learned from these men, etc., that her, are teaching her uh, these lessons, um, instead, it's like, why was she so naive? Why was she so insecure? Why was she so uninterested before? It, in, it kind of interrogates the very concept of why women were perceived as docile and uh, empty, etc. And so it has a lot of, for the first half, a lot of strong male characters imposing themselves on, on Rachel. And as a result, the first half is kind of like, you need to know where it's going to appreciate the beginning, otherwise it feels a little rough. Uh, and that's why I think this is a good book that on reread would be better, because you know where you're ending up. You know the full intentions of the author and the full intentions of the novel to be able to get there. Um, very interestingly enough, includes Mr. and Mrs. Dalloway from Mrs. Dalloway. It has, I think his name's Richard, I always forget. I think it's Richard Dalloway and Clarissa. They're both there in her first novel and very interesting portrayals. Changes, changes Mrs. Dalloway, honestly, because actions are done by those characters that very much will now inform my opinion of them in Mrs. Dalloway. So already an experience re reading, like reading her novels, which has been worthwhile. Uh, this, I'll go into it later, but yes, this is longer than any of her books that I've read as well. I think Orlando's like 200, I think Mrs. Dalloway is about 150, A Room of One Own is like 90, this is 400 pages, and as a result, I did admit that I, I, I was feeling its length by the end. Um, so, three stars, good book, enjoyed it, looking forward to where she grows from there. Um, Next up, Edge Dancer, Stormlight Archive, Brandon Sanderson, um, book 2.5. Uh, I was hesitant, to say the least. When I originally read it, this is a reread. When I originally read it, I gave it, I think, a, like a four. On a reread, I gave it a 3.25. I enjoyed it once again. That's a 6.5 out of 10. That's above a 5 out of 10. That means I enjoyed it. That means it's a good book. It also feels weird to say that Edge Dancer by Brandon Sanderson is a better book than a Virginia Woolf book. That's just a funny thing to have back to back. But enjoyment has an element involved. Edge Dancer is enjoyable. Rereading it, I was kind of like, this is just filling a gap for certain characters who aren't even main characters. This is like, not like tertiary characters 
having them be like, well, they need to go from here to here. I'll write like a little thing to fill it in. This is a footnote extended to be a novella. I'm sure people are gonna come in the comments and fucking roast me for it and be like, um, actually, you're a fucking idiot. I don't care. That's just how I felt reading it. I like Lyft. Hot take. I don't mind Lyft. Apart from when she's talking about her awesomeness, and apart from when she's talking about pancakes, then I want to kill myself. Once again, we're, we're into the series, so I'm not going to go into things. However, I'm going to take this moment to give a little bit of a, a call out to Brandon Sanderson, in my opinion, because there is a certain thing that I don't like about his writing. And it's not just in this series, it's in Brandon Sanderson's just cosmic. I know I haven't read everything Brandon Sanderson, so I'm going to preface this by saying I have not read The Sunlit Man, I have not read You, Me and the Nightmare Painter, I have not read Skyward, etc. All of these things. You could tell me that he's fixed every single problem that I'm about to address, but for me personally, reading the books that I have, which is a fucking lot, I've read Lantris, Warbreaker, Stormlight Archive twice, going to, I've read Mistborn Era 1 twice, I've read Mistborn Era 2. I think that's a pretty fucking big amount for one author. So I think I have the right to voice an opinion. And that opinion is that I don't like how Brandon Sanderson writes class issues. I don't like it in the slightest. Spoiler alert for the Cosmic. Spoiler alert specifically for Mistborn Era 2 and Edge Dancer slash Stormer Archive. I think that's a big enough break. Um, he writes Lyft and Wayne the same way. Lyft addresses herself as a lower class person. She says that in the book. Wayne is also a lower, lower socioeconomic, lower class person who becomes friends with Wax and moves from there. But he grew up poor as well. And those two are written the same as kind of supportive characters, which is that Brandon Sanderson defaults to they're poor people, so they talk funny, and they're very they're funny people. They they do the comedy, they do the yuck yucks, and they do stupid jokes. That's the thing. They do stupid jokes and they talk funny. Both Lyft and Wayne have obnoxiously stupid accents that are English coded. That's my problem. They're both English coded in how they speak. And as a result, I kind of have had this conversation in Discord and someone very like intelligibly pointed out that Britain has a different class system compared to the the states where he's from. But my issue is, is that he clearly understands what he's referencing because Wayne and Lyft both have English styles to their dialogue and their dialect. And as a result, I think he's referencing the class divide within the, our country. And if he's going to do that, then he understands it, or he thinks he does, and then he's doing a bad job. That is my personal opinion. I'll die on that hill. It leaks over to different things. I think he does better jobs in different series. I think Mistborn Era 1 does a better job with Vin, even though I still have problems with that. Um, but, and, and it's fair to say, Stormlight Archive is a goated series. Mistborn Era 1 is a goated series for me. I gave all of them like 4.55 stars. This is not me saying that I don't like Brandon Sanderson. I just wanna make that perfectly clear because some people on the internet are fucking clueless around critical thinking and being able to take any critique over their favourite author. This is me saying that I am a big fan of Brandon Sanderson. Very clearly, I've read a lot of his stuff, but I have a big problem with that. I think that whenever I think about it and I start noticing it in his books, it puts me off because this is not the same, in my opinion, as the, like, do you know when people critique Stormlight Archive and they're like, well, the Alethi are, are genociding the Parshendi, as if they're, like, geniuses for noticing that. It's like, well, actually, the Alethi are kind of doing a bad thing. It's like, of course they are. We're aware of that. They're a warmongering race genociding and colonizing a land as revenge. 
they are the most fucked thing I've ever seen. Very clearly. And that's addressed to, like, there are conversations between, like, Kaladin and Syl around the idea of, like, um, well, how come, like, you get to decide who to kill? How come you get to decide the morality of who's dead and who's alive? And it's essentially like, well, we're reflection... Us as Spren, us as the people from the spiritual realm, are reflections of you in the physical realm. So we also have the same awful racism and the same awful kind of anthropomorphized Is that the word? Interpretations of what human life is. And... As a result, it creates a nuanced argument. As the series has developed, it has developed the the nuance around the idea of, like, the, it just, yeah. It's one of those things. I, like, I personally don't think that the Stormlight Archive has a problem with that. I think it addresses it very openly in terms of the fact that that is what the story is. We are following a warmongering, horrid race. That is a fact. Um, uh, uh, but what my point is, is that that's addressed within text. I don't think this is addressed within text. That's why it bothers me is because I think it's just implicit in his writing. Um, I don't think he even thinks about it. Hence why I critique it. Spiel either. You're welcome. There's my Brando Sando talk. Uh, I also have, uh, following the series, uh, following the video where I said that I was going to, you get to choose what I read next, uh, which there is a poll in the community tab. If you want to choose what series I read next, it's there. Currently, the band is winning, which is Kings of the Wild. If you don't want Kings of the Wild to read, go vote for the other ones. People also commented uh, a lot saying about the Singing Hill Cycle and Murderbot, which are both series that I've started. And essentially been like, just listen to the audiobooks. And I was like, you know what? I should listen to the audiobooks. So I re-read, re-listened to, as it were, The Empress of Salt and Fortune by Nevo, which is the first book in the Singing Hill Cycle. And I gave it a 3.5 star. Uh, I think the audiobook did a, like, a, it was a much better experience listening to it because it's an oral kind of history uh, being told in the story. And so having that verbally read to you is is a good experience however i do struggle to connect to audiobooks and maybe that had something to do with it but i did go from a four down to a 3.5 purely because uh, or maybe i'm just being more a little harsher with my ratings maybe maybe sometimes i've been too too nice in my opinion but 3.5, that's a 7 out of 10. That's a good book. I enjoyed myself. I like the characters. I like the world building. I do think that the story is a little... It's, it's abstract in terms of what I meant to get from it. I don't really have the time to become emotionally involved personally. Um, but I think it's an enjoyable story of um, our, our main character, Chi. And they are a cleric from the Singing Hills kind of sanctuary. And um, they are collecting oral history. So they're going around and interviewing people, finding stories of the land. And we follow them as they um, they interview Rabbit, who is an old woman who uh, kind of chronicles her experience meeting the Empress of Salt and Fortune. And yes, enjoyable read. Going to continue the series. I'm planning on doing like one then the other. I'm going to go from Singing Hill Cycle to Murderbot, Singing Hill Cycle, Murderbot. So that's how I'm going to do it. And then finally, talk about saving the best for last. This is another one that I've recorded a review for because this is a 5 out of 5. There will also be a discussion coming at some point, hopefully, because I just love this book and I wanted to talk about it. It's The Spear Cuts Through Water by Simon Jimenez. Um, this was chosen by Trey and Ben for the Patreon pick. Uh, it was between this and Gideon the Ninth. I put it in a vote in Discord. If you want to join the Discord to kind of have stuff like that or just talk, then feel free to join. Uh, and also the Patreon. It always very much helps, especially as someone looking for a job. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I did this and it was so good. I'm not going to go into it too much once again because I'm going to have a dedicated review. If you want to hear those thoughts, it will probably come out either middle of next week or the week after type thing. But five out of five, uh, you 
have to experience this, in my opinion. This is the perfect level of experimental fantasy, hearkening back to myths, legends, predecessors in fantasy history, pulling on all of these things to create a unique story, a truly unique story. You are experiencing this as the main character, it is in second person, and uh, you go to bed one night and are transported to um, the inverted theatre, which is this um, liminal space between waking and dreaming. And you go there once in your life and you get to watch a performance, a performance of something. And the thing that you follow is, is the, the story itself. And so that it blends perfectly between perspectives. And I'm gonna go through it in the, the review. It's I've already recorded it and I look forward to it. But yes, five out of five, beautiful writing, wonderful world building, nuanced characters, just genius setup, genius narrative framing. This is a book that completely succeeds on the basis of its narrative framing. There are certain things that I do not like about the book. I, I wouldn't say that. It's not that I don't like them. I had gripes with the book. I had little things that I was kind of like, mm. I think it's not as thoughtful as the rest. But overall, it's a five out of five. This will be on my best of the year list without a shadow of a doubt. Loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And that's it. That's everything I read. Let's give a little looky at the camera. Oh, fuck me. Oh, let's give a little looky to the camera. And yeah, that's it. Pretty good. Oh, wait, I was going to do a TBR. But I feel like I've recorded it for a long time. I'm not going to do a TBR. Um, I'll just say the books. I'm going to read the rest of the Ending Fire trilogy, uh, which is the Battle Drum and the Ending Fire, because I have an E arc for that. Um, so that's the, the rest of the series that's the final strife. I'm rereading Oathbringer. Uh, book three in um, the Stormlight Archive. I'm going to read Night and Day by Virginia Woolf. That's the next book in her chronology. Uh, uh, next book chronologically in her bibliography. And I'm also going to read Monstrilio. Uh, that was picked by Trey for um, Patreon pick as well. So if you want to have a, a chance to pick what I choose next month, and by that I mean in uh, September then feel free to join the Patreon because then you get to put a thing in. And there's not many people in there, so you've got a pretty good chance of getting it. Um, if you did enjoy, please do like, please do subscribe. And as always, have a nice rest of your day.